Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thank you for joining me, Tammy. Tammy is here to talk about her new book, which is called The Dementia Caregiver, Learning How to Pace Yourself. Oh my God, I can actually read the screen. (laughs) Thanks for joining us, Tammy. Thank you for having me. So tell us about your book. First off, you are a dementia trainer. I mentioned that in the intro. Yes. Tell us about yourself and then we'll talk about the book. I'm okay. It's early. (laughs) (laughs) That's okay. I'm a dementia consultant, educator, speaker, and now the author of Essential Strategies for the Dementia Caregiver, Learning to Pace Yourself. And I also facilitate numerous uh, caregiver support groups. So what inspired me to write the book is a lot of times caregivers get a diagnosis. The families get a diagnosis. They have dementia. They leave the office. And now what? So I wanted to provide a book that would actually literally um, walk side by side with the caregiver. It addresses what the changes are going to be with their loved one, how dementia is going to affect them behaviorally, cognitively, their personality might change. And then I wanted to help the caregiver learn how to deal with those changes, because as you know, dementia just doesn't affect the person who has dementia. It affects the caregiver and family, the whole family. So they're, they're, they feel very lost. They feel very lonely. They they feel unprepared. So I wanted to write a book that walks them from the, the beginning all the way through till end of life. And it's equipped with tons and tons of strategies. But and it talks about uh, how to communicate with a person with dementia, how to connect with them when when you feel they're drifting off. It talks about 11 of the most challenging behaviors. It talks about the different emotions and feelings you're going to go through and how to deal with those feelings and emotions and to normalize what the caregiver is going through. So I just wanted to give them a book they could put right by their, their bedside. And it's a tool, it's a resource that will help them walk through this journey and pace themselves through this journey because it's such a long, it can be such a long journey. Yep. My mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. Sometimes when I think back, it's like you'll see maybe a millennial caregiver on a social media channel. And I think, oh, those poor people. And I'm like, wait a minute. My mom started showing signs of Alzheimer's when I was 32. (laughs) So it's like it's hard to remember before, you know, like the before times when she was just mom. And then it's it can be really a challenge sometimes you know, because there's things like my daughter's getting married and, you know, Mother's Day is coming up. And it's just like, man, there's just some times when you just really wish you had your mom. Yeah, exactly. And what's more painful to not have them in front of you as this disease changes them or when they're no longer here. I mean, two different feelings of grief, grief and loss after they've passed, but the grieving that goes on as the dementia changes them is awfully painful as well. So we we call that anticipatory grief. We call it ambiguous loss. So we lose them during this journey and try to figure out how to relate to them. And then the finality of it when they're no longer physically here. Do you think there was a difference for you? If you were to say losing her and having her present as this disease took her and now not having her would you say that either one of those times is more painful than another or just different? Well, they're definitely different, but I would I would lean more towards when she was still alive. It was really hard because originally, like a lot of the world, my daughter was planned on getting married in 2020. Uh-huh. <laughs> Shock. <laughs> Wonder why that didn't happen. <laughs> and yeah. because my mom was so far advanced in Alzheimer's, you know, it's my we had, she and I, my daughter and I had conversations like, well, do we bring grandma? I mean, my mom and my daughter were very close. Yes. And then, you know, but it's like, and my daughter said, but I want you to enjoy yourself. And if you have to worry about your mom, da da da. And it was just like, that was a horrible thing to actually deal with and think about. Cause it's like, 
of course I want my mom to be there. Yes. But this woman who thinks I'm her best friend that's got advanced Alzheimer's, she's going to have a clue. Yes. Yes. And, but not bringing her felt bad and bringing her felt bad. So I guess I could thank the pandemic for the, you know, postponing the wedding for two years. Right. Um, right. But it was losing her during the pandemic was a challenge because she died March 31st of 2020. Wow. So we had just entered, you know, the quarantine, stay at home orders, whatever you want to call it. Yes. And it just felt like, okay, mom died and we're just doing our normal thing again. I mean, yes. it's just, you yes. know. And early on in the pandemic, a lot of the care communities locked the, the families out. Yep. So they couldn't even go and visit their loved one. And um, even more painful to be locked out and not be able to go and see them. So when she, when she passed away, were you able to go and see her um, during the the what we call the the transition phase? The transition phase, no. So she broke her leg March eighth. She went back to the care home on the twelfth. So on the twelfth, the fourteenth, and the sixteenth, I was there. The twelfth, I walked in the front doors of the memory care yeah. part of the community as normal. Yeah. On the 14th, they said you have to go through the the main entrance of the assisted living, which, of course, was like the far opposite corner. Yeah. And we were having a little rain in March, which, you know, it's California. We don't get that much rain anymore. Yeah. Um, and I had so I basically had to fill out a form that said, yeah, no, I don't think I have covid. And the 16th I went in, I had to do the fill out the form. I had to do something electronically and they took my temperature and I thought, well, this is getting to be a real pain in the rump. And then I went home that afternoon is when our governor basically said, yeah, the seven counties of the San Francisco Bay Area. Pfft, yeah, you guys all stay home. So, yeah, it was like, OK. And there are episodes where I talk about, you know, it's been a week. I'm getting concerned. I'm, yes. I'm concerned she will forget the relationship she thinks we have. She will forget me. She won't trust me. Blah, blah, blah. Yes. Literally about day 10, I was starting to lose my mind. And I had a very good relationship with the executive director of the community. And I was about to call him and say, uh, I'll climb in through the window. I will wear a hefty bag over my body. What the yeah. hell do you want me to do? I am coming in. Yeah. And so, but I was trying to be patient and trying to be reasonable. Not always things that I, you know, I'm getting better with age with those, but not always my strongest skill set. And they, one of the caregivers that I was really close to, she called Sunday, March 29th, and she said, mom's not doing really great. We think she'd, she'd benefit from a visit from you, which I now have translated as to, oh, crap, this woman is dying. We better let them in. Yeah. So I saw her on the 30th. My sister saw her a different wow. hour on the 30th. I talked to the hospice nurse on the 31st, and then I did a podcast recording. <laughs> And then I wow. went to have lunch and they called and said, come now. And thankfully for th those of us that lived reasonably locally, yeah, they let us in because we en there ended up 10 of us outside her room. Wow. And the poor executive director was having a coronary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so and in as show of the sign of the times, my aunt, who's my mom's youngest sibling, was wearing a, a face mask. Because she lived in a communal senior housing. She lives in, um, mm -hmm. what are the, well, it's Section 8 here in California. What do they call that? Subsidized housing. Uh -huh. So she lives in subsidized senior housing. So she was already aware that she might have been at risk. Yes. And the rest of us are like, what ifs? You know, <laughs> it's just, it just seemed so weird. But yeah, so I didn't see her for two weeks, but I did at least get to see her the day before she passed away. Yep. I told her she did a great job as mom and yep. we were all going to be fine and all those good things. And, yes. you know, for so you had closure with her. Yeah, it helped because when I walked in and I, I saw her and it's like and th some people who don't have pets are not going to get this and they're going to think I'm terrible. But I saw my mom and I went, oh, crap, Ola. I've seen that before with one of my dogs. This is not going to end the way I expected. Yeah. Because I figured, okay, she's going to be in a wheelchair. I'll be able to get her from point A to point B nice and quick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I won't have her walking behind me, watching her toes, trying yeah. to step around the shadows and yeah. making me crazy. And I, when I saw her, I was like, mm, nope. 
this is not going where I thought it was going. So yeah. it was a little bit of a shock and a little bit of a relief. But the biggest problem was when my dad died in 2017, you know, we got flowers and meals and yep. cards. And yep. my mom died one family. They like called up and they said the hubby was slow roasting some ribs and they were going to bring us some. They didn't even ask. Um, and she brought everything like soda, you know, like drinks and napkins. I'm like, we're stuck at home. I have all yeah. this stuff, but yeah, I appreciate it. We got like one card and one, did I get flowers? I think the people that brought food brought flowers too. Yeah. But then the rest of the world was all wrapped up in everything else. So yep. it was like, and then, you know, family, well, between the COVID and family, my mom has never been interned with my dad. So she is still with me. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I, I, I do want to acknowledge. So it's been a little just two years. You just celebrated mm -hmm. a two year anniversary. Yep. So I wanted to acknowledge that. Yeah. 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 That's sometimes hard to imagine because there's times I still think it's like 20, like we're just in the beginnings of 2021. It's like we kind of have a lost year in there. But yeah, the last couple of years have been a lot. Yeah. You know, and sometimes I I step back and I think about it. And this is kind of something I think caregivers should should also try to acknowledge and I bet you, you you'll agree and you might even have a talk about it in your book a little bit maybe mm -hmm. in a different way but you know sometimes when life seems really difficult or you're mm -hmm. not happy with where you're at yeah step back and ask yourself what the last couple of years have been like for all of us because for me my entire life has been shaken up three four different ways yeah yeah and I'm still laughing about it because it's either you know it's not all bad yeah. But there's yeah. times when it's like, I should have, I should have, could have, should have, could have, would have. And I'm like, wait a minute. We had a pandemic. We've moved twice. Yep. We lost my mom. We lost the dog. We lost my grandmother. Yeah. There's a lot of losses. <laughs> yep. I mean, grandma was 103. So yeah, that's okay. But that one was ex more, more expected. But yeah, it's just, you know, when you add it all up, it's like, dang. Yeah. Maybe I yeah. should just be sitting in the corner with my head open. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're doing good work now. There you go, right? Yeah, so that we all, we all have to give ourselves uh, credit. Yes, we do. Even yeah. when we don't think we're doing as good as we should. And I'm almost certain that that's in your book. It is. It is, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the top five emotional issues that I deal with in my private practice, as well as in the support group, is caregiver guilt, Right. And um, often caregiver guilt is a result of either self-imposed expectations, family expectations or messages or culture, right? And that's one of the things why I wrote this book is the caregivers need to really embrace the beautiful job that they are doing taking care of a loved one with dementia because it's not easy. It's challenging, as you know, it's demanding lots and lots and lots of responsibilities. And I have to honestly say, I haven't met a caregiver yet that just isn't a phenomenal person, just an amazing person. And we get caught up with, you know, shoulds are often uh, an, uh, a way of recognizing I have an unrealistic expectation. I have a, a little section in my book talk about stop shooting yourself, S-H-O-U-L-D-I-N-G, because if we can convert those shoulds into what we can do, will do, and want to do, it's very empowering. So often I will tell my clients that when you hear yourself should on yourself, you know, shoulda, coulda, woulda, right? That's often an indication that you are, you have expectations that are unrealistic. And when we convert them and develop what I call a can-do attitude, it's empowering, you're proactive versus passive, but more importantly, it helps with time management, it helps you prioritize and it focuses on what you can do, what you will do, and what you want to do. So also in this journey, I think it, what can help caregivers very early on is know that you have limitations. Know, recognize, acknowledge those limitations because there is no 100% perfect caregiver. There's no 100% perfect way to walk this journey. The best way to walk this journey is you learn by doing. Unfortunately, we learn by doing. So the one of the main reasons I wrote this book is that it just breaks me up inside 
to see these people doing a beautiful job caring for their loved one, and yet they're beating themselves up. And they've got this judgmental voice, this critical voice that doesn't belong in dementia care because the real problem is dementia, not you, not your loved one, but everything you're going through what your loved one is going through, what you're going through and what your family's going through is because of dementia, not because you're doing things that are wrong. So I have a question for you, addressing somebody that might be at the beginning of this journey. Yes. So many people, especially I think spouses, but not having been in that particular role, I can't speak to it 100%, but we all think, you know, and, and even, you know, Children taking care of their parents yes. go through this, but they make promises like, I'll never put you in a yes. memory care, or, I'll, you know, yes. or they don't think they need help, which yes. I tell people, you know, when they say things like, you know, well, you know, we got this, I, I, I got it under control. And I just, I just stop them and say, my mom had Alzheimer's yes. for 20 years. Yeah. So this is April 25th, 2022. Why don't you tell me what April 25th, 2042 is going to look like? I'll wait while you yeah. figure that. Yeah, no, you don't know. And yeah, neither do I. I'm lucky if I know what next week's going to look like. Yeah. So, you know, I do know what next week's going to look like. But two weeks from now, me, no. Um, yes. It's yes. just, we have no clue. So how do we get them to understand, besides my blunt, you know, kind of crack over the head statement? <laughs> yes. How yes. do you get them to understand why they need why they need to bring in help early on, which I have tactics that I recommend that make it easier. At least I yeah. think it would make it easier. Yes. Why do they need to bring help early on and so how do we do it? Early on, um, one of the best things caregivers can do is really get educated on what dementia is going to do. And the, my book really maps it out very, very well, what to expect, how it's going to affect your loved one, what you're going to go through and how, and notice pace, how to pace yourself, learning to pace yourself because we are born thinking we should be able to handle it all. We're born, we have this commitment to our loved one. They're our loved one, whether we're a child, whether we're a spouse, and we feel obligated, we feel committed, we want to be able to take care of them. And I also think culturally and in families, what are the messages? We're selfish if we can't do this. We're not a good person if we can't do this. So I think one of the biggest issues is getting caregivers to see, I cannot do this alone. I do need to pace myself. As you mentioned, your journey was 20 years, right? Some yep. might be eight, some might be five. My grandmother's was 25 years. Ooh. So you, you don't know how long, but the sooner you can accept and give yourself permission to identify the things you like to do, identify the things you want to do. And then we ask for help for the things you can't do. And it's hard. Asking for help isn't an admission of failure. It's not an admission I'm letting my loved one down. That's a big, big, big piece is if I can't do it and they're relying on me and we made these promises and it's my parent or it's my spouse, I don't want to let my loved one down. And what we have to do is talk about what makes you think you're letting your loved one down and come up with a plan on how to manage this disease so it's not at the expense of your physical, mental, and emotional well-being. And I have to laugh in my support groups, we, the caregivers who've hired people to come into the home to help will often say, I should have done this a long time ago. Then the caregivers who are resistant are like, well, I'm just not ready to do it yet. And I think as it as we become more educated about this disease, I think then it will become easier to see, wow, I really am going to need help earlier rather than later. But I think we're still learning a lot about dementia and the toll it takes and how long this journey can take. And so I have to start gently massaging the commitment and the expectations you have of yourself and be able to transition those expectations to make it more realistic. So you hit the nail on the head, and that is we feel hugely obligated, and we have to be able to admit and acknowledge and accept what I don't want to do. 
And so I help people make that transition. But a lot of it is changing our expectations, changing our self-imposed expectations. Again, the family messages, we've got a challenge and then cultural messages. So I think it's not a simple fix. It's a process a process of understanding, a process of learning, a process of educating, and then a process of change. That makes sense. As many people know, I recently had a website blow up Uh unexpectedly. That was not on the agenda. And it, it overran the episodes that started season five. And I had that kind of you know, I've been waiting around for somebody to help me fix this one thing on the website that it blew up. And I, you know, it's like I had all of these plans for the start of season five that basically got put on hold. And when I let it frustrate me and upset me because it shouldn't have happened, it's it's negative. But when I stop and think, you know, people listen to these episodes all the time You know, they don't, it's not like, I'm not like a daily news podcast for people, you know, if you don't listen for a week, you, you've missed out. No, people go back. I, my people will be listening to this episode, you know, five years from now, I'm sure. So when I kind of just let go of that stress, because I wasn't going to be able to like wave a magic wand and get a new website done in a week. And I'm not sure I would even want to, it just, it's like, okay, just tackle what I can tackle and just deal with this other problem. It's very similar to dealing with dementia, unfortunately. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And it's just, it's kind of what you were talking about, changing expectations. It's like, okay, well, what I expected to do, what I should have been able to do, those are gone. So what can we do? And how do we move forward in, in a positive way? And so it's like, okay, you know, it's, it's still difficult. I'm still yes. a little stressed, but yes. you know, yes. yeah. you know that, that's, I think that's a really good analogy because I, it feels a lot like when I dealt with my mom, like, why is this happening? You know, yep. I don't have time for this, just all of that frustration. And then when you, when you stop and think, okay, what's the really critical thing? And it's like, well, we're, we're dealing with that. Okay. Yes. Yes. Moving yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, there's a tendency where the caregiver gets very, very hard on themselves because they lost their patience or they they raised their voice or they yelled at them and they want this journey to end. Those are all normal feelings. Those are all feelings to be expected. Those are normal feelings. And so what I try to do is help people learn how to cope with those feelings, substitute the judgmental self, substitute the critical self. And what I encourage people to do is to develop compassionate self-understanding. And I talk about that in the book and how to, how to make that transition. Because the reality is you are doing the very best that you can on any given day. Some days are going to be better than others. And that's the honest truth. Some days you may lose your temper. We just want to minimize the intensity and the frequency and how often that happens. But that's a normal feeling because you have negative thoughts and feelings towards your loved one and you're so angry about this disease. Don't take it out on yourself. You are not the problem. The caregiver is not the problem. What would we do without you in this picture? What would loved ones do without you? And so I want caregivers to give themselves more credit, but I also want to give them permission to have those emotions and feelings, to know you're going to be angry and you are going to get frustrated, but that doesn't make you a bad person. That doesn't make you someone that is no longer um, appreciated. You have to give back to yourself. You have to support yourself. And the other thing I hear a lot of is that the dementia, the the person you're taking care of, your loved one, doesn't isn't able to say thank you, isn't able to to acknowledge the beautiful job you're doing. You have to do that for yourself. And as a matter of fact, in my book, there is a, a whole page on what if the dementia your loved one could say this to you before. And what if you could say this to your loved one before this disease progressed? And I'm hoping people will read that. And and before they get to the point where they feel unappreciated, you're able to express and have this conversation about the dementia care needs ahead of time. But the caregiver is not to blame. 
And then a lot of times caregivers will say, I don't like who I've become. That usually is my red flag that says that now it's time for us to do something different because this disease is being done at the expense of you not liking yourself, then we have to do something different. So I'm all about supporting the caregiver. And and again, I want my book to make you feel like I'm right by your side. I'm I'm hanging on to you. I'm walking side by side. I'm holding your hand through this journey, giving you permission to feel the feelings and figure out how to cope with those feelings and really give back to yourself and appreciate the person you are. That's definitely, that's, that's how I feel about this podcast, but how I actually know somebody who has made the comment. Um, we have entered the, I think he refers to it as the thankless, the thankless time because this person's spouse does not, does not, uh, express any appreciation. Yes. So, and he's, he's working through that, but what would you suggest for somebody? And I, and this is probably going to sound a little sexist and I apologize for that, but it seems I did not really experience that with my mom. Although Mm -hmm. I think that was just a lot of our relationship anyway. Uh huh. Um, but I think, you know, when I think it's more men and forgive me if I'm wrong and I hope I am, but sort of, <laughs> I, I feel like they do things for you and they expect acknowledgement. I know how that, that's how it works in my house. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But how would you tell, like, what would you suggest to this particular person? Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. I started using a product that all you caregivers need to try. I started taking AG1 from Athletic Greens after my workouts because I needed a quick and healthy way to refuel my body. While there are lots of options, most don't taste great, and I don't eat or drink things that don't taste good. So what is AG1? Well, with one delicious, mildly tropical flavored scoop, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins and minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to fuel you for your crazy day ahead. AG1 helps support mental clarity throughout the day, and you know how important brain health is to this gal. It has over 7,000 five-star reviews and costs less than $3 a day, and you know your time is worth more than three bucks. Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine to recover. I'm sure you're aware that there may be a connection between poor gut health and dementia, so this is another way to help protect your brain. As caregivers to someone with a cognitive impairment, this is also an excellent way to get much needed nutrition into someone who is slowly losing the ability to eat. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D, which is also important for brain health, and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash emerging. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash emerging to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now back to our conversation. So basically, um, it is an issue across the board, male or female. And um, so a lot of the dynamics. So let's separate we have a relationship with our loved one pre-dementia. And then we have this relationship that changes as a result of dementia. And so a lot of times we have to understand what that relationship was like pre-dementia because your buttons are going to get triggered with dementia. And one of the things I highly recommend is, is know what those triggers are. And so sometimes a trigger is pre-dementia, pre-dementia, they didn't feel appreciated in the relationship. Maybe they didn't get that acknowledgement pre-dementia. And now I'm taking care of you. You are, I, you are literally surviving because I am supporting you. And we still want that, that appreciation and that acknowledgement. Now, it also happens where pre-dementia, maybe you had a lot of that support and you got a lot of that appreciation. And now dementia has taken that away. So again, the way that I address it in the book is, you know, know what your triggers are. Let's plan for them. 
And then how do you give back to yourself? The person isn't not, is not, the person with dementia is not telling you intentionally they are not capable. It's something they cannot do. Some people with dementia may be able to do it, but the majority of them as this disease progresses. So this is where I say, what would you like to be said? What would, how would you like to be acknowledged? And you create that for yourself. Because ultimately, when this journey is over, when this journey ends, you have to feel good about you and the care that you provided for your loved one all along the way. Whether they acknowledge it or they don't acknowledge it doesn't change the beautiful care that you provided for your loved one. So we talk about those expectations and how do we make up for what you don't get? Because that triggers a lot of resentment, Mm -hmm. a lot of resentment. I'll, I'll process resentment with a lot of clients because this disease causes that. So we have to process it, know that that's a normal feeling. And what's causing that resentment is what now we have to address. And then how do we process it and get you out? to the other end and be able to see I am doing a good job because in the end, it's how the caregiver feels about the care they're providing. That makes sense. I've seen younger caregivers like millennials taking care of a parent, you know, like on Instagram. And I think, geez, how do they do this so well? Because, and you've hit on it, they don't seem, or they're not they're not broadcasting their resentment. Some of them, they they broadcast the struggles. Yes. But I'm not seeing the resentment. And I don't think it's because they're just hiding it from social media, which would be a typical thing we would we would do. But I think they've they've figured out how to process it, or maybe they just never had it in the first place. My mother was great at pushing all my buttons, which I kept thinking. You tell everybody I'm your best friend, and I know you wouldn't do this with your best friend. Why the hell are you doing it with me? Yes. And there was yes. a lot of things that she would do that when I was growing up and a, and a younger person before she had Alzheimer's, it was like, lady, you used yes. to complain when I did this stuff. And it was so difficult yes. not to like turn her words back on her yep. that she would have said to me. Yes. But I knew better. I knew yes. if I said those things, we yes. would have a fight and that would just be ugly. Yes. But how do we take the resentment? Because what am I, and this isn't resentment so much. I had I had a lot of anger with, you know, even after my dad died, it's like my, my parents' house was paid for. You know, my mom got a decent social security check. They had investments that, you know, were quite healthy. And I, I just kept thinking, you should be doing all the stuff you want, not yeah. this this Alzheimer's nonsense. And it just, I had to like really step back from those feelings. When those cropped up, I had to, I had to be like, yes, she should be doing those, but that's not where we're at. So how do we process the resentment? Because I've seen a lot of people, you, know, you go on the Facebook groups and yikes, resentment yes. is all over the place. Yes, yes. And so, you know, I have the four D's of dementia care, right? Detach, document, diffuse, and distract. So we use a lot of tips and a lot of strategies. But I think, number one, we have to give ourselves permission that resentment is is an issue. Resentment is something that may come up. Resentment is okay to feel. And I think if we give ourselves permission to feel the resentment, then we can process the resentment. Where I think we get stuck is it's not okay to feel that way. And um, I'm a bad person for feeling resentful or resentment and wanting the other person to change. People with dementia can't change. We can change. But first, it has to start with giving ourselves permission and identifying a lot is until we talk about it. And I'm like, oh, it sounds like resentment or this sounds like anger about such and such and such and such. So I think here again, giving people permission to feel and process those feelings and and find support. I can't say enough about getting emotional support. I can't say enough about support groups or finding a therapist or finding a specialist who understands dementia and can walk you through this journey. But I think it has to start with being okay with the feelings because those feelings don't make us feel good about us. And yet we get angry at ourselves now. And then we get angry at the other person. And I say, 
three things. Allow your feelings and emotions to be of benefit to you. So in my book, there's three questions I have people ask themselves. What is causing you to feel this way? What are the feelings trying to tell you? And what do you have to do differently? And when we walk through that, it gives you a place to process these feelings and understand the resentment. You 90 percent of feeling better is understanding it and knowing why I feel this way, and then the ten percent is processing it. That makes sense. That's, those are three great questions for us to deal with everyday life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But, I have but a perfect, again, go ahead. I'm sorry. I have a per, it's okay. I have a perfect example, and I, I mentioned this. I mentioned this quite a bit. Right after my mom fell and broke her leg, I did a recording with a guest who is a big mindfulness person. He, he's taking care of his dad. I mean, he had to move home with his parents, which that's going to be really hard as an adult. And it just upends your life, as we all know. And yes. what he taught me, and I use anger because this is what I was experiencing that day, but with any emotion that crops up is is you you want to address it the same way. So you when you're like I was literally so stressed out trying to make a decision do I do the surgery to yes. to fix mom's leg yes. and yes. all of the negative issues like yes. why would you do that with somebody with advanced Alzheimer's yes. she's not doing the physical therapy which she needs whether we do the surgery or not it was just like hey and it just I could yes. literally feel the negative emotions brewing yep. up. So this was right at the shutdown. So guess who was the only one home with me yes. besides the dogs? And I knew I'm like, I, I'm i going to explode. There's yes. going to be a fight. It's going to be an ugly day. And his words popped into my head. And it was just to stop and take a deep breath yep. and acknowledge the emotion. Doesn't matter yep. what the emotion is. Sadness. Yep. Mine was anger. I said, hello, anger. Why are you here? Yes. And it clicked right in my head. The reason yes. I felt that way is because I wanted the best for my mom. And literally Absolutely. in 30 seconds, I went from about to splatter negativity and anger all over the household, which was not a benefit of my husband, to feeling good about myself. Yeah. And I mean, literally, I'm not even sure it was 30 seconds, but yeah. it, it was fast. And I was like, wow. So, and there's just so many times when it's like, if you can just stop yourself, because we, we, inflate decisions is like, oh my God, this is a life or death decision. Well, pretty much most of our decisions are not. They just feel that way. <laughs> but you know, you brought up a couple of things that triggered some more thoughts. And, and here again, um, we're used to repressing our feelings and emotions, right? And dementia is going to bring them to the surface. I mean, they really bring them to the surface. That is but true. the other thing I want, I want to remind everybody too is, 99.9% .9 of the time or 100% of the time, the intention is always with the best interest of your loved one in mind. The problem with that is sometimes the intention is we have to do what's best for you or and or we have to do what's best for them, but they can't make that decision. So this burden and responsibility falls on your shoulders and um, there's no wrong decision. You have to look at the intentions behind the decision. If the decision ends up not being a good one, doesn't necessarily mean it was a bad decision. You always have to look at the intention was to make a choice that was in the best interest of my loved one. And if you can remember that, that will help you to see that there are certain things I have no control of. And there's certain decisions I'm going to make that are in the best of intentions, but they may go against your loved one's wishes. They may go against what your loved one may have wanted because dementia demands more care. Dementia may not allow us to honor our loved one's wishes, does not make you a bad person. So when you're questioning your decisions and these decisions fall on your shoulder, then we want to look at you are not at fault. You are not to blame. You are trying to make the best decisions given the circumstances. So great that you could see the anger, you could identify the anger. And we and what I encourage people is to take it one more step. 
what is causing you to feel that way? Okay, now I can put a name to it. And why am I feeling this way? And what do I need to do differently? And that allows us to feel a sense of control over the circumstances. And we, my favorite one is the serenity prayer, you know, Mm -hmm. letting go of what I don't have control over, but more importantly, giving me the wisdom to know the difference. Um, and dementia is, is the problem, not you, not your loved one. And if we can remember that, then we can step back and not feel like we are solely the person that is going to make a right or wrong decision. There's no right. There's no wrong. It's a matter of navigating this disease to the best of your ability. If we make a decision that isn't favorable, what can I learn from it? Mistakes are not failures. Failures are not mistakes. Failures, mistakes are opportunity to learn and grow from. So when you went through that process, how did it change you and how did it make you feel better about the ultimate decision you did make? Which I am curious, what decision did you make under that circumstance? Well, I didn't, I didn't have her go through the surgery Okay. for a lot of reasons, because the biggest one was I was not, you know, I, I, it's like one of those things where I'm pretty sure that anesthesia on somebody with a broken brain is a bad idea, you know, kind of convinced me differently was the position that I was in. And I just, she didn't even know she broke her leg, even though it was wrapped in like the big Velcro, it wasn't in a plaster cast or anything like that. It was. It, I'm not sure what fabric it was, but it, you know, she didn't even notice. Yes. And I'm like, how are the, how are we going to take care of somebody who needs to heal from a surgery? And I had to do the same kind of surgery, similar flew off my bike in 2016 and broke my collarbone. Yes. So I have a metal plate yes. and you know, it's mostly, it's just, you gotta, you gotta know what you shouldn't do while you're healing. Um, shrug my shoulders was one of them. <laughs> yes. Yes. But I thought, how is how are we going to help her heal if she doesn't even know she's gone through this? And how would how would she deal with the confusion and the pain and the da 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 da? And it just I just did not find a good reason to do it. OK. And, but it felt for a little bit wrong not That's to right. at least consider it. But That's right. When the surgeon didn't really push. Yes. You know, I don't yes. know if it's because he knew it wasn't a great idea or because yes. COVID or both. Yes. That kind of helped a lot. So, you yes. know, and I'm really glad that the last two weeks of her life or two and a half weeks of her life, she wasn't in more pain dealing yes. with healing because obviously doing the surgery probably wouldn't have helped. I mean, her body gave up like was typical. Right. Right. It was just. And- and we it's don't just the know, last three. We? <laughs> sorry, yeah. we're talking over each other. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. It's okay. It happens. Um, it just, it was, you know, it just, I assumed that she would be in a wheelchair and we'd, I'd be pushing her to the park to watch the kids like we did and it would be all fine. And, you know, and I, so I was fine with the decision, but it was, you know, it's not what she would have wanted. But when the way it turned out, I'm like, okay, I, I definitely made the right decision. <laughs> Yeah. And, and there again, right. Each, each decision is a separate decision, each decision under the circumstances. And um, some people would have had the surgery. Some people would not have had the surgery. And I guess what I'm trying to say is on some level, and, and again, another reason why I did write the book was to give you more confidence in your decision-making ability to really feel more confident that when I make a decision, these are the circumstances in which I made the decision. Because the outcome may not be positive or favorable doesn't necessarily mean you made a bad decision. We don't have a golden ball. If we had a golden ball and if we could change things, we wouldn't even want dementia to be on this planet in the first place, right? That's for sure. So, um, but we don't have that luxury or that ability. So you're all making the best decisions you can under the circumstances. And when they don't turn out favorably, don't beat yourself up because we made the, look at the intent behind the decision. The intent behind the decision, again, almost 100% of the time is to do what you think is best. 
What we don't have control over is the outcome. The outcome now doesn't dictate whether you did a good or bad. The intention is why we make the decisions we make. So, and these, these are horrible decisions that you are placed in. These are horrible, big, major decisions to make. And I hear them all the time. I have one client who had to make a decision whether her husband has, uh, he had tongue cancer yes. and um, she had to make a decision about it. And she decided to go through with it and mm. ended up bad, bad, bad outcome. Then I have another client who, you know, their loved one's pacemaker had to come up for a new battery needed to be replaced. The dementia was advanced, decided not to replace the the pacemaker. Are either one of them right or wrong? Both of them are making the best decisions under the circumstances. And we have to believe and, and trust yourself more that you are making the decisions with their best interest in mind. And that being said, sometimes what's in their best interest is what is in your best interest is what is going to be best for you. So let's go back to what you started with, Jennifer, and that was you know, bringing in home care. There's not many people I know of that are going to say, oh, yeah, they're going to be favorable of bringing in home care. Yeah. <laughs> you, we don't hear that. Nope. But what we have to understand is, is that dementia is demanding more home care, bringing in home care. Dementia is demanding that you have more help. And so you have to believe I'm making this choice because it's in the best interest of my welfare as well as well as my loved one. Because your loved one doesn't get it, because your loved one doesn't understand it, doesn't mean it's a bad decision. We still have to make decisions that are going to be supportive of you, the caregiver, that are in your best interest, which in the end is going to even provide better care for your loved one. And I think that's where we get stuck. I don't want to upset my loved one. I don't want to go against, again, the wishes. And yet, dementia demands an extraordinary amount of care, and one person cannot do it alone. Well, I will tell you and repeat for the audience what I learned from a family that I swear did this 100% right. They were. Um, I will link that episode in the show notes so you guys can listen to the whole story because it's fantastic. But this family, uh, grandma, it's, it gets complicated because I talked to two, two generations, mom and the grandson. But the, the mom, the grandpa basically was taking care of grandma. He was doing a good job, but he just got exhausted and he said, I can't do this anymore. So he asked his kids to please research care homes and get back to him. And so they did that. And the, the initial guest is also a podcaster. And so he's the grandson and they, they basically formed what they call the family care committee, yeah. but what they, to, to boil down a two hour podcast episode into five seconds here, a little more five seconds. This is what I recommend people do as early on as possible. Sit down and make a list of all of the household responsibilities, all the responsibilities you have to manage and tackle today. Now do that for the week and then now tack on the month. So now you've got a list of all the crap you have to do that isn't necessarily taking care of somebody else. That's just the stuff to like maintain life. Now make a list of everybody you know that you think will be willing to help. They do not have to be in the same town because there are a lot of things we can do online that, you know, like you and I were talking before we recorded, you know, neither one of us are ne necessarily really swift with tech and other people are. So now you've made a list of all of the responsibilities and all the people you know, but on the list of the people you know, write down what you think their best skill set is. So if you put my name on this list, you're going to put creative, likes to cook, likes to bake, you know, might be willing to do stuff with the dogs. You're not going to put call the insurance company, deal with the doctors or the bank because that makes me insane literally in two minutes. I do not know why. Thank God my husband is good with those things. <laughs> he worked in banking for 20 years. He speaks bank. I don't even, I don't even go there. I leave it up to him. And I did that with my mom too. I left, he, he handled things until they realized that he wasn't authorized. <laughs> yes. And then we would do a, you know, speaker phone. Yes. And you can always tell the, like the bank or the insurance representative would be like, is it okay if we talk with him here? I'm like, oh uh, Yeah. 
because yes. you're not talking to me alone. Yes. So now you have a list of responsibilities and people who can help. So when, you know, Tammy says, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry to hear about your mom. Is there anything I can do to help? Boom. Yep. You have an answer. Yes. And you have an answer that's not going to overwhelm her and make her feel like she's now just been drug into your dementia hell. Yes. And it's not people that are dealing, you know, dressing your loved one who probably at this stage won't need those kind of helps. But now you're bringing in people to help around the household. They're going to get a little bit more comfortable with that idea. And you might be able to ease, sneak in more of a home health aid type care later on. Yes. You're not, you're not going to hit the wall of, you know, I'm not letting that person in my house. Blah. Yes. <laughs> and, and now you bring up another good point. And that is something, again, let's go back to support. So I have an exercise, um, a, a writing exercise, very similar to what you just suggested. And, um, and so to capitalize on what you said in this left section, it is all the things, you know, I don't want to do, can't do, uh, blah, blah, blah. But then on the right side is the resources. And when you do reach out to family and friends, capitalize on the things that you know they like to do. So I'll use myself as an example. Thank God you're a good cook. I'm not, but I am great as companion care. So I would be a person you'd want to call to bring in to keep your loved one company or to take them to lunch or take them here and there. But support, support, support. So early on, you would ask, you know, what can we do to get people to ask for more support or get more support? One is to be honest with yourself and say, I'm going to need help on this journey. And we start it any place we need to in this journey. Beginning is great if we can do that. So yes, you're absolutely right. But we have community resources. We have professional resources. We have friends and family. And you want to plug in these holes, you know, when, you know, maybe you need somebody to go out to get your groceries. You've got to be specific. But I think one thing we absolutely have to make certain is you've got to be okay with asking for help. We That's want true. to help you. We want to do anything and everything we can to help you, but we don't know what you need. And so a lot of times the caregivers hold back on asking for help because they don't want to burden the person. They don't want to bother the person. And here, again, it's getting okay with, I need help. I will ask for help. And make a list of all these resources, family, friends, community, faith-based, professional resources. And we have what I, basically what I think we're doing here is we're developing what is called a care plan. Mm -hmm. And this is your survival guide. And it's going to be modified. You may extend it. It may decrease. But it's this ongoing list of resources that we can have that you could call and we plug in what the need is. And we have a resource to fulfill that need. So that that that's a great point to bring up. That the build of that support network is critical, super important. Well, I think I like calling it a survival guide better than care plan because care plan. I don't know. That sounds a little uh, antiseptic. Uh huh. But it, really, it is a survival plan. It is a survival. So you're the first person that's called it that. So we're going to call it, instead of your care plan, we're going to call it survival guide. I think it also emphasizes the importance of doing this. Whereas if you think that you've got it handled, you don't really need a care plan. But yeah. you're probably going to need a survival guide. So Yeah, yeah. You know. And and keep in mind, it's okay to have two, three, four people for the same job, right? Because now all we have to do is rotate these people. There's four people who can go to the grocery store for you. And remember, though, it's always ever changing. As this disease changes, the needs change. And so it's important that I guess also what you and I are both trying to say is the caregiver is equally as important as mm -hmm. the person you're taking care of. And the caregiver is probably even a little more important to take care of because at the end of this journey, we do not want it to be at the expense of your physical, mental, and emotional well-being. And we know how this journey goes. And we want to give you permission to ask for help. But more importantly, be okay with knowing you're not going to be perfect. Know you're going to have limitations. Know you cannot do this alone. And if you can't accept it, let Jennifer and I give you permission to accept you do not have to do this alone. 
definitely. That sounds like a perfect place to stop. We went a little longer than normal, but that's cool because I seriously think your book and my podcast together, people, because we've taught everything that's in your book, I have an episode on so they can read the book, hear the episode and implement the survival guide. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Awesome. There we go. Well, thank you so much. And you can find all of Tammy's information in the episode notes. Just scroll down on the podcast player you're listening to this on. She's got great resources. I've got other episodes you can listen to that we've referenced today. It is all good. And we are here to help you survive this journey and thrive. Thank you, Jennifer, for having me. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.